And we're all here to talk about big history. And we're all here to talk about the Leadership Lecture Series, which I have come quickly in my brief tenure at Dominican to believe is an activity that is distinctively and importantly Dominican. Welcome to all of you, and particularly to the first year students, the first year experience students. Thank you for sharing your classroom. This is the eighth year of the Leadership Lecture Series. It's been an opportunity for the university to welcome the greater community to join our faculty and students as we all learn of actions and ideas by leaders. We seek to promote constructive change in the world through our own actions, our own intellectual engagement, and by learning of the actions of others. The lecture series is the public face of the Institute for Leadership Studies, housed in our School of Business and Leadership, ably led by new dean Dan Mashavi, and supported and the Institute is supported through that, that effort through its creator, Denise Lucy, who you just heard from. It's an incubator for leadership learning, ideas, and actions. We cannot do these events on our own, not only in inviting the larger community, but in having support for the larger community. Dominican has been blessed with the support of Book Passage over the years, and it has been invaluable in the type of speakers we can bring to campus and the kinds of conversations we can have as a community. So please join me in thanking Elaine and Bill Petricelli and the staff at Book Passage. I have also learned that our Board of Trustees is profoundly supportive of this institution, the work that we do on a daily basis, and of our intellectual ambitions. And this leadership lecture series has been underwritten by Private Ocean, one of the oldest and largest privately held wealth management firms in Marin, led by Richard Stone, the CEO, who is a member of the university's board of trustees. Please join me in thanking Richard and Private Ocean for their leadership here at Dominican. Big history is the ideal way for us to launch this year's leadership lecture series. Big history is our first year experience program. That means something different at Dominican than it does at literally any other place in the world. There are lots of places that have first year experience programs. Some of them are what you call College 101, uh, where you learn to do, do your laundry and you learn how to adjust to class schedules. But we trust you all, you know how to do that, we're going to ask you to do more than that. Some first-year experience programs, those that are intellectually rigorous, focus on the great books. So you go in and you read Aristotle and Plato and you argue about them. There's, those are important programs, but at Dominican, we think that they're not enough. And we actually think the old culture wars debates uh, between the great books and other are not even interesting anymore. We think our job is to model the best of contemporary intellectual thought and we think big history embraces that idea. It embraces it because it's big and it covers everything. It brings interdisciplinary knowledge to bear on our understanding, not only of Plato and Aristotle, but of their place and our place in literally the history of the universe. It synthesizes history, astronomy, chemistry, biology, geology, sociology, and a number of other fields to provide a cohesive picture of the history of the human race and its relationship to the planet. Dominican is the first university in the United States to provide this program, and some 30 members of our faculty have worked together to form our first year experience big history program. It is truly an intellectual adventure for all of us. It is truly an institution-wide effort, and is truly unique to Dominican. I wish to thank Mojan Baymon for her work on the big history curriculum here at Dominican, as well as our own big historian, Cynthia Stokes Brown, for her tremendous contributions to the discipline and the subject. And finally, I welcome the students and acknowledge first year experience students. Uh, there are students here who are not in their first year experience, but are actually student leaders who have helped host this and our host ambassadors this evening led by AASDU President Nick Parrish and Rachel Sadaka. Thank you for assisting us with this evening's event and serving as ushers and greeters this evening. One of the fun parts of being president is I get to capture the big ideas in a very big way, 
but I don't have to do all of the work behind it, and the work is what's most important. So I'm going to introduce the person who has helped create this program and is leading it this year. It's my pleasure to introduce Mojan Beman. I'm Mojan Beman, and I'm an associate professor of English and the director of the first year experience program, Big History. Tonight's event is part of our first semester curriculum in Big History, a one-year program that takes the participants and in that, I actually include the students and the faculty on an immense journey through time, almost 14 billion years of it, to witness the first moments of our universe, the birth of stars and planets, and the formation of life on Earth. We also witness the dawn of human consciousness and the ever unfolding story of humans as Earth's dominant species. Awe and wonderment are part of our engagement with fundamental questions regarding the nature of the universe and our own momentous role in shaping possible futures for our planet. I'm frequently asked how a Dominican university, a, un a formerly Catholic university, can teach big history. My answer is quite easily. <laughs> Dominican University of California is a secular institution. However, it is firmly rooted in its Dominican heritage, a heritage that's been shaped by generations of religious educators on this very campus. For over 120 years, the progressive Dominican sisters have lived the four Dominican ideals of study, reflection, community, and service. We Big History faculty stand on their shoulders. In truth, the sisters discovered and promoted this universal science-based story long before the faculty added it to the curriculum. And how is our first year experience an embodiment of our Dominican ideals? As a community of seekers of knowledge, we Dominican students, faculty and administrators have gathered to study big history, reflect on this universal narrative's implications regarding global interconnectivity and interdependence, and have sought to include this knowledge in our curriculum as a required foundation for service to our regional and global communities. There you have them, the four Dominican ideals, community, study, reflection, and service. They're all represented and they're all part of our program. It is now also my pleasure to introduce Richard Stone, who has been a part of the Dominican community and has supported us for a long time. He's been a leader in the wealth management business for more than 40 years and is a co-founder and CEO of Private Ocean, one of the oldest and largest privately held for management, uh, wealth management firms in Marin County. He also is the co-author of his industry's first code of ethics. Mr. Stone is a member of the Dominican University of California Board of Trustees. Indeed, his service to Dominican reflects his commitment and his dedication to education and our local community. He is also a member of the Global Business Council at, at his alma mater, San Jose State University, and serves advisory boards of the Presidio Bank North Bay and the UC Berkeley Extension Personal Financial Planning. On behalf of the university, I would like to express our gratitude to Private Ocean for its generous support of the Fall 2011 Leadership Lecture Series. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Stone. As a member of Dominican's Board of Trustees, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here and the greater community as we meet Dr. Brian Swim and enjoy an exclusive screening of his new film, Journey of the Universe. I've attended many ILS series over the years and have found them to be informative, entertaining, and inspirational. My company, Private Ocean, is a proud sponsor of this year's fall series. I congratulate Dominican on its leadership in the big history movement. The curriculum we are developing here at the university will benefit not only our students, but also students in other institutions throughout the world. Big history is central to tonight's film. 
Journey of the Universe will take us on a voyage through time and space to examine the nature of our physical world through the lens of a multitude of disciplines. Such a story, Dr. Swim has remarked, will assist in the emergence of a flourishing Earth community. Dr. Swim is a professor at California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. He received his PhD from the Department of Mathematics at the University of Oregon in 1978 for work in gravitational dynamics. Dr. Swim is the author of The Hidden Heart of the Cosmos, The Universe is a Green Dragon. He is co-author of The Universe Story, which is the result of a 10-year collaboration with cultural historian Thomas Berry. Dr. Swim is also the creator of three educational video series, Canticle to the Cosmos in 1990, Earth's Imagination 1998, and The Powers of the Universe in 2006. He lectures widely and is presented at conferences sponsored by the American Association of Advancement of Science, the World Bank, UNESCO, the United Nations Millennium Peace Summit, and the American Museum of Natural History. Something else I just learned recently in his undergraduate days, Brian was just down the road from us at uh, Santa Clara, and for the Penguin athletes here, he was a Bronco basketball player. And for those of you that don't know him, we'll see in a moment that I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I induce Dr. Brian Swift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sat on the bench a lot. Uh, <clears throat> it was a great view, though. Great to, great to see you all here, especially the first-year students. It's just a, um, it's a real thrill. I, I want to thank um, President Mary Marcy and Trustee Richard Stone and Linda, I mean, uh, Denise Lucy as well, for, for bringing me here. I'm really thrilled to be part of this endeavor, as you'll see. A little personal note, sort of established a close relationship with us before we began. The, um, my first, my first um, public lecture was given right here at Dominican University 30 years ago. The lecture didn't deserve that applause, but I've been working at it for 30 years, so I'm getting somewhere. But I mean, it, it meant a lot to me to sort of come back here after 30 years. Yes, uh, Phil Novak and I were young in those days. There's Phil. Oh, yeah. So, but it's really, it's a thrill to be here. I, in, in trying to give you a sense of how I see um, tonight, I feel like we are joined in a very ancient enterprise. The humans have been asking I mean, sir, you come to consciousness and you, you go, what's going on? I mean, what is happening? And in, in particular, why am I here? Now, these, these big questions like this, we've been asking them for at least 100,000 years. We'll never, I guess, give a completely satisfactory answer but there's something important about asking the questions. We know, we, we know the Africans were asking these questions 100,000 years ago, and so we, we're jumping into that stream. Now, at the very beginning, I don't want to be misunderstood. I am not some hotshot scientist that says we now have all the answers. Not at all. The, the traditions, the classical traditions in religion and philosophy, the artistic traditions, all of them have provided amazing insights. And the religions you come from, your families, all of them have been providing you and your siblings with a fundamental meaning in life. 
what I'm about to say here is not competing with that at all. It's, it's simply to say that science has another idea that is adding to that mix. So success for me tonight would be to, to introduce some notions that might intrigue your imagination as you ask these questions. Here's my, uh, God, I hope I brought it. Here's my teaching aid, all right? Uh, this is actually, um, this rock comes from the island of Samos. I use it in the film. There's a little award for anybody who guesses where afterwards. Okay. Here's the story of the universe. This is what we discovered. The entire universe at one time was smaller than this little stone. So, what do we know about the entire universe? There is something like a trillion galaxies. Okay, these numbers are big, but still, just try to take it in. A trillion galaxies. Each galaxy, around 50 billion stars. Each star, more or less the size of our sun. Our sun, a million times the size of Earth. And of course, Earth is many, many times bigger than we are. A trillion galaxies, each with 50 billion stars, once occupied a space smaller than this little stone. That's the story. We started off in a form called plasma. Elementary particles really crammed together tightly. And then it unfolded into galaxies and stars, and here we are. And you know, sometimes I, um, that, I mean, that's the whole story right there. <laughs> if you can figure that one out, you can leave right now. <laughs> no point in hanging around. I mean, uh, I, sometimes, I sometimes feel s similar to uh, Copernicus. I mean, not, not that I have his genius, but I'm just saying, here's Copernicus. I sort of imagine him. He's discovered that the Earth is going around the sun. It's a big discovery. He can't contain it, so he has to go and tell everyone. So here he shows up in a town in southern France. Copernicus, by the way, was Polish. This was before Poland existed, but <laughs> eventually that became Poland. So he goes down to southern France, and he walks into town. He says, I've got big news. You think the sun pops up in the morning and goes across the sky. It's not true. The earth is going around the sun because we're spinning. Okay, there you are, right? You're in southern France. You've been fishing all day, and this guy is telling you, what? You're saying the earth is spinning? If the earth is spinning, how come the Atlantic Ocean doesn't wash up over our shores? You know, so um, we're still trying to take in that insight. We still say things like, hey, you know, well, the sun just came up. We still talk as if the sun is going around the earth. I mean, it's, it, was only, it was only the 16th century, so it's relatively recently that we made that discovery. <laughs> but now we have a new one to deal with, all right? Everything you've ever seen in your entire life, plus all the stuff you see in telescopes, was once in a space smaller than this. Whoa. All right, so what are the implications? Here's an implication. I mean, here's a... I'm saying here's a way of stepping into the new story. It's this. We're discovering a new way of understanding intelligence. During the modern period, we use the word intelligent to discuss humans and maybe God, but not the universe, not the earth. That was just stuff. It was resources. It wasn't intelligent. Okay, look, I got something for you. Say you had a little piece of matter this big, all right, and then it expanded out and became, became galaxies and hummingbirds. Does that qualify as intelligent? Or maybe we should use intelligent for the little humans that haven't yet figured out how the universe did that. 
See, we're okay understanding ourselves as intelligent, but there's something about the universe, there's some kind of a form of, an, of creative intelligence that's at work in the universe. That's the first step towards this, this new understanding. It's that we're enveloped, not by a meaningless, mechanical, dead universe. We're enveloped by a creative, astonishingly intelligent universe. Second step, last, this is my last idea, okay? What a relief. Last idea. The, um, in your course, one of the fundamental ideas is thresholds. It's amazing discovery of the scientists. The universe doesn't just stay the same. The universe doesn't just go through a series of cycles over and over again. The universe goes through these thresholds, fundamental changes. One more little part to it is this, I find so astonishing. The universe itself creates the conditions that enable the threshold to take place. Let me say it in another word, another way of saying it. The universe creates new creative capacities that then enable the universe to create itself in a new way. The one example that's coming up next week in your lectures, I think, is that at one time, the universe had no planets, just had stars. And then the stars actually developed the planets. But once you had planets, here's the point. You have the capacity for a new kind of creativity. It's an amazing fact of the universe. The reason the big history approach is so exciting is because it is a fundamental part of the threshold we're in. The humanity has entered into a threshold. And one way to say it is this. It's no longer enough to study how to become an American. It's no longer enough to study how to become French. It's no longer enough to study how to become African. We have a new possibility. We have the possibility of discovering what it means to be a dimension of the planet, a dimension even of the universe itself. And this may be an idea I just want you to maybe reflect on in the future when you're working through your, the readings and the papers in your course. There's a way in which the universe has created the conditions for bringing a new kind of human forward, including you. There's a way in which you will discover creative capacities in the context of big history. Creative capacities about yourself in the context of big history that you would not discover in the context of the nation state. This, uh, these ideas I just gave you were, uh, they were part of the film originally. And then, uh, and then PBS said, well, you have to cut it down by half an hour. And that was painful. So um, the film itself is 52 minutes long, and the, the 30 minutes that were cut out is what I just went through. So this is the first time the full version, really, <laughs> is going to be experienced. So, wait, wait a minute, huh? You don't know yet. I mean, let's, let's, let's watch it first before. All right. So as the, um, as the lights, as the lights start, and we sink into the, the hush of the, the magic of being together in the night. Many of the world's greatest stories begin with a journey, a quest to answer life's most intimate questions. Where do we come from? Why are we here? So, especially, would love to hear what uh, any kinds of um, what, you, what your feelings might have been uh, among the first year students. Any sort of um, responses that you might have? Um, yeah, yeah. I actually just want to know your opinion on how you think, like the universe is gonna like cease to exist? Like what do you actually think? If you can like predict or like have these theories about how it started, like are we able to actually predict 
How where, and when? Where it's going. Yeah. Where it's going. Tremendously important question. Where is the universe going? The, um, okay, we don't know. <laughs> but I'll tell you something that I find really, really interesting is, is the, our ignorance on this point is, is really kind of fascinating. I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. So, the, um, typically, the, the way in which the, the universe is talked about in terms of the long-term future by um, scientists is that it's going to expand all the way out, on and on and on and on and on, forever, never, never, and slowly life will die out and it'll just be dust. Okay. There's a picture that gets you out of bed in the morning, you know. <laughs> or the other option is the universe will expand out for a long, long, long time and then we'll collapse back down and destroy everything that was created. Right? And that may be the end of the story, or it may actually bounce. So there's a, that's a little more interesting. But here's the part that I was fascinated by. When we look at the evidence in the universe about which way it's going to happen, either expanding or collapsing, we go back and forth as to which we think will happen. Now, you think this would be a kind of a simple thing to figure out once and for all. Is the universe going to expand forever? Or is it going to collapse? Right? And so here's my conclusion. The fact is we, we can't really know for sure. My conclusion is the universe hasn't yet made up its mind. <laughs> so an, another way to say it is this. this and this would be my, this is how I, you know, I personally think about it. Okay. Okay. Um, if you, if I were a scientific elementary particle and we were having this conversation 14 billion years ago, we're all elementary particles, and um, you ask me, well, what do you think is going to happen in the future? I go, well, I think maybe the elementary particles will expand forever or maybe they'll collapse, right? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I wouldn't have been talking about hummingbirds and rainbows. And it, it wasn't in, it wasn't in, that level of the universe to know what the universe was creating. And, and that is, that's where I actually feel uh, we can move forward. We can't imagine what is coming forth in the universe because we're actually in the creativity that's bringing that forth, even though we don't know what it is. So the kinds of qualities, the kinds of Complex realities that are coming forth, I think, are actually beyond even our ability to imagine in a careful way. What I try to suggest, though, is that there are tendencies in the universe. And so that's why all of that, that story about invertebrate evolution, we actually have become more bonded to one another. We've, we've become more caring over 500 million years. So in, in, a, in a kind of in a, a dark way, without details, we can imagine that in some sense we're moving toward a greater capacity to love. Even beyond the greatest saints that we know about, it'll be a capacity to love that goes beyond our limits of consciousness now. Well, that was great. We had a male and a female. That was terrific. They're going to represent our class. And yes. Yes, here we go. Look at this. Fantastic. Yeah, but she does too. Sorry, I'll first. And you're next. You are next. Hi, everybody. So Hi. I have a question. What part of the journey of the universe um, is inter interested you the most? And which part of what we just saw in the video you would like to discover more? Which part interested me the most? And which part would I like to discover more of, right? Okay. Wow. Uh, let's see. What interested me the most? Uh, uh, I think it was actually the supernova explosions. 
and I kind of I'm reluctant to say that because you might say, oh, God, it's so typical. You know, a guy likes violence and explosions. But, I mean, I just, I just find it just so unbelievable that an entire star had to explode so that we could have skin. They'd like the carbon atoms of our skin require a star to explode to create the carbon. Let me tell you, I would have created the universe differently. <laughs> Here's how I would have created the universe. First, I'd have the universe create the little bits that we use, right? So I'd have the universe create like some hydrogen, some helium, some carbon atoms over here in a big, big box, all right? Then take those and make starfish, you know, and coral reefs and so forth. That seems like a very sensible way to go. How is it that in order for there to be a single butterfly, you need an entire galaxy and exploding stars? That is a stunner. And I, I like this. In other words, it, 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 it sort of explodes my normal way of thinking. And given the way in which we are dealing with the planet right now, having normal ways of thinking exploded is a pretty good thing. You see, so that, I think that was just so thrilling to me. What I'd like to know more about, I think I've already said, I would like, I am fascinated by the way in which um, the care and love um, have deepened over the millions and millions of years. And so if I, the one thing I'd love to know more about is the evolution of love into the future. Yes, sir. Hello. Okay. All right, I have a question. Um, in the film, it seems like that you highlighted life a lot, and I was just wondering that if you ever stumbled upon any uh, life on other planets, or if you had any le legitimate theories or evidence on life on another planet. Excellent question. What about life on other planets? All right, excellent question. The, um, the, the current situation is this, among scientists, uh, a, a number of scientists are deeply convinced that given the self-organizing dynamics that we're discovering in the universe, they're deeply convinced that throughout the Milky Way, life is sprouting on hundreds of millions of planets. And then through the other, the other galaxies, they're all sprouting forth so that the universe is coming forth with life throughout. You know, they've all got their stories to tell. We'll get together. It'll be fantastic, right? So many, many scientists are thinking that way, right? On the other hand, a lot of scientists, having looked at the detailed process by which life and intelligence has emerged, especially advanced life, they're deeply convinced that nowhere in the universe but on the planet Earth does life exist. Just to quote one person, Peter Ward, geologist, University of Washington. Once again, we don't know. We don't know. It is, it is but, but here's one thing we do know. Here's one thing we do know, okay? If life is actually sprouting throughout the entire universe, wow, that's amazing. If, on the other hand, life exists nowhere but our planet out of a hundred billion galaxies, that's amazing. <laughs> Either way, it's amazing. We don't know. We don't have the evidence yet. There's a hand back there, or... Up here. Up here? Up there. Maybe you go that way. Miss, maybe somebody said up here, but go ahead, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I was very interested in the last part of your film, like how uh, human nature is just affecting the natural world. And I'm wondering, as a student, how can we learn more about that? Because I feel like there's not really much access to that type of information. So where can we like read about it, or what can we do? You answer this one. No, no, no. I mean, I mean there, what, what classes should I recommend? Jim. Can, can, I have the, can I have the microphone? We have a, 
a scientist right here. Because your, the, your desire to learn about that is absolutely central to where we are as a planet. It's a, it's a beautiful desire, and the answer is right here. What should she study? What courses should she take? And any course uh, in, in the biological sciences, um, uh, but especially um, ecology. Take the ecology classes right here. Probably some of the most complex uh, sciences uh, around. Ecology is the science to study. Great. And there was, there was someone over here? Did we find that person? Join the Sierra Club. There's another one. Good. Are you taking from non-students now questions? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Um, Moshan touched on this earlier, a tiny bit, but one of the things that um, you don't talk about in your film or in your lectures is God. And I know that it's such an integral... Oh, we've just run out of time. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's really I have to stop now. I'm kidding. Come on, go ahead. It's such an integral part to people's lives. So you must be approached often with the question of God. And I'm just curious as to how you handle that question when it's brought up. Very poorly. Okay, I, I would say this that uh I mean uh do we have time for this? We do. This is the last question? No, 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 no. Okay, I just don't know where we are. Well, I mean, here's one way to think about it. Um, I'm thinking. Um, I guess I would, I would, uh, If you start talking about God, then you've got to know whose God you're talking about. And they, notice how people are leaving? <laughs> there's the answer. <laughs> so I, here's the way I would, here's the way I would, I would just, I would, I try to say this, that the, 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 the context of this, this new story of the universe, of big history, the context is going to enable us to discover so many different things about traditional disciplines. So inside an evolving universe, you have a different kind of economics. Inside of an evolving universe, you really have a different kind of governance. Inside of an evolving universe, you have a different kind of theology. So I, I think that the, the, the theologians are the ones who are going to discover new insights into the nature of God within this so I, 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 guess, I guess my way of thinking about it is this. The universe, just in the way it functions, is so spectacular that it can be regarded as one ongoing miracle. A miracle in the sense of an astounding creativity that surpasses our normal way of thinking. So there's a... There's a divine dimension involved in that, perhaps. Certainly, it's not something that we, can, that we can understand with any finality by reducing the universe down to its component parts. My way of talking about this mystery is to say that there is, that the universe is pervaded by a creativity and that it lives uh, within all of us. Is that yes? Yes, sir. Yeah, is there a micro microphone nearby? What time is it? Is it nine? Uh, great TV show, by the way. Thanks for that. You're and welcome. I just had one question since you're really interested in supernovas. Uh, what, I mean, I'm sure you know about Betelgeuse, right? The one that's supposed to be the closest one that's going to be a supernova, a supernova soon. I was just wondering what's going to happen when those 
particles, you know, all the different stuff reaches Earth? Does it like just land on us and we're covered in sun dust now and everything's good or? I don't know, I've heard a couple of different theories about it. I just wanted to see what yours was. Uh, yeah, that, okay, so what the gentleman's referring to is a nearby star that is a likely candidate for explosion. It's, it gets worse. Uh, if it explodes with a certain amount of power, right, an exploding star would volatize the earth. We go from happy-go-lucky people in an auditorium to a form of gas. Okay. It gets worse. It may have already exploded. But the news hasn't reached us yet. <laughs> so the, um, the conclusion is, forget about getting comfortable. We live in a universe that's, that's filled with this kind of tension and violence. But the aim is not like security. The aim is not really getting a great 401k, then you can relax. The aim is to participate in the creativity. I think in a certain sense for humans, knowing, knowing about the fierce dimension of the universe keeps us from sliding into compromises that we will eventually hate. And instead, choosing, choosing to be at the cutting edge of what might bring forth a more harmonious future. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs> good night, good night.